All right, so this is the third part of chapter one. A few years later, his friends introduced him to an older woman named Mary Owens. By all accounts, she was overweight and missing a few teeth, but she was educated widely and had money of her own. Lincoln hinted he would ask her to marry her. He would ask to marry her, providing she assured him first that she would accept. Mary hinted she would indeed consent, but only if Lincoln asked first. The situation seemed hopeless. Eventually, Mary left New Salem altogether, but the two agreed to keep exchanging letters about their future. Lincoln was not very romantic. In 1837, he wrote to warn Mary that if she married him, she would, quote, she, quote, would have to be poor without the means of hiding your poverty, end quote. As Lincoln expressed it, whatever woman may cast her lot with mine, should any ever do it, it is my intention to do all in my power to make her happy. But, he advised, my opinion is that you had better not do it. You have not been accustomed to hardship, and it may be more severe than you now imagine. That was enough for Mary. She turned him down. I was really a little in love with her, Lincoln later admitted, but Mary Owens claimed that Mr. Lincoln was deficient in those little links which make up for the chain of woman's happiness. At least it was so in my case. Even after Lincoln became president, she never regretted saying no to his half-hearted proposal. His feelings hurt. Lincoln was, said some unkind things about Mary, rare for him, and concluded never again to think of marrying. As he joked, I can never be satisfied with anyone who would be blockheaded enough to have me. But it was clear he was disappointed. Believing he would never have much of a personal life, he went back to work in Vandalia. He fared much better in his public life than in his private life. Abraham Lincoln's finest moment as a young state legislator came in March 1837 when he signed his name to a protest against slavery. Most Americans, including those living in free states like Illinois, continued to be silent about the slavery issue. In those days, even, even the protest that Lincoln wrote with a fellow assemblyman named Don Stone admitted that the U.S. Congress had no power under the Constitution to interfere with the institution of slavery in the different states. But Lincoln and Stone were outraged that the Illinois legislature had just passed a resolution disapproving of abolition societies, groups devoted to ending slavery. Many people of the time considered these organizations radical and dangerous. Abolitionists, the name given to people who wanted slavery abolished immediately, were often attacked and some were murdered. Most Americans still considered them to be extremists. Lincoln was no abolitionist, not yet, anyway, but he believed that the Illinois Resolution missed a very important point that slavery was morally wrong. So Lincoln voted against it. When it passed anyway, he wrote his statement of protest. The protest declared slavery to be both injustice and bad policy. It was his first public statement about the institution he would later destroy, but he would say nothing more about slavery for years to come. That year, Lincoln did not I'm sorry, that year Lincoln, Lincoln did cast one other important vote to move the state capital to a new city, Springfield. He quickly decided to make the fast-growing town his own permanent home as well. On April 15, 1837, he packed his belongings into a couple of saddlebags and rode on horseback from New Salem to the new capital. Once there, he simply walked into the room of an acquaintance named Joshua Speed and asked if he could share his living space with him. Speed was agreeable, even though there would be only one bed for the both of them. Well, Speed, Lincoln said, dropping his few position, possessions onto the floor, I am moved. Abraham Lincoln was 28 years old. As it happened, it was the midpoint of his life. He had exactly 28 more years to live to the day. <laughs>